Thank you. Good morning. We well, haven't already. Let's open our Bibles together to, to Revelation chapter 21. Um, we'll, we'll pick it up there in verse 9 and um, we'll, we'll make our, our way down to the end of the chapter again. As I, I said earlier, that the, uh, again, the title of the message is, is All for the Glory of God. And we're going to see you know, God's, God's working, um, especially in the description of New Jerusalem. Again, I, so often we, we do. We make it about us. Like, okay, God is creating this for us. And in, in a sense, yes, but in a big sense, no. God is creating this for himself. Um, and he just allows us to, to be there with him. So we're going to look at it from, from God's perspective. Why, why God is doing what God is doing. Why God is creating this the way that God is creating this. And hopefully maybe that might not necessarily answer a lot of questions, but it should maybe settle some things in our hearts and, and in our minds this morning. Let's stand together as we honor the reading of uh, the holy, perfect, and errant word of God this morning. Revelation 21, beginning in verse 9, Scripture says this, Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues came and spoke with me, saying, Come here, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain, and he showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. Her brilliance was like a very costly stone, as a stone of crystal clear jasper. It had a great and high wall with twelve gates, and at the gates twelve angels, and the names were written on them, which are the names of the twelve tribes of the sons of Israel. There were three gates on the east, and three gates on the north, and three gates on the south, and three gates on the west. And the wall of the city had twelve foundation stones, and on them were the twelve names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. The one who spoke with me had a gold measuring rod to measure the city and its gates and its walls. And the city is laid out as a square and its lengths and its length is as great as its width. And he measured the city with a rod. 1,500 miles, its length and its width and its height are equal. And he measured its wall 72 yards according to human measurements, which is also angelic measurements. And the material of the wall was jasper and the city was pure gold like clear glass. And the foundations of, of the city wall were adorned with every kind of precious stone. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third, um, col wow, colcent, I don't know how to say that. Someone knows their precious stones? Um, shall send, I don't know, the fourth emerald and the fifth uh, sardonyx and the sixth sardius and the seventh chrysolite and the eighth bearer and the ninth topaz and the tenth uh, chrysophase and the eleventh jacinth and the twelfth amethyst. And the twelve gates were twelve pearls and each of the gates was a single pearl and the street of the city was pure gold like transparent glass. And I saw no temple in it. For the Lord... God, the Almighty, and the Lamb were its temple. And the city has no need of sun or of moon to shine on it, for the glory of God has illuminated it. And its lamp is the Lamb. And the nations will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. And in the daytime, for there will be no night there, its gates will never be closed. And they will bring the glory um, and the honor of the nations into it. And nothing clean, and no one who practices um, admonition and lying shall ever come into it, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I just, uh, Lord, I, I pray that we, we take this, this description of our, our future heavenly home called New Jerusalem. Lord, I, I pray that we would... Uh, we would see it through your perspective. That we would understand that the people that you purchased to bring here, the way that the city is designed, and the activities that go on in and around this city are all for one single purpose. 
for your glory. Lord, I pray that you you not only remind us of of that this morning, but Lord, I I pray that you would impress that, that principle upon us because, Lord, this not only exists for your glory, but we exist for your glory. And as your redeemed people for the glory of your holy name, that, that should mean something to us. That should drive us and move us to, to live lives for the glory of our, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord, I think so often our, our view of heaven is, is reflective of our view of our own lives. Sometimes we think heaven exists for our glory, and I I think sometimes we live our lives like we exist for our own glory. Remind us this morning, Lord, that that is absolutely not true. We were not saved for our own glory. And we should not live redeemed lives for our own glory. But we should do, as Scripture says, all things for the glory of God. Lord, I pray that this morning you, you show us what that looks like. You show us what that looks like corporately as a church. But more importantly, Lord, I, I pray that you would show us what that looks like in, in our lives. Show us what that looks like in our Monday and in our Tuesday and in next month and in this coming year and next year. Lord, help us to ask the question, what does it mean to live my life for the glory of God? And Lord, I pray that you prepare our hearts to be shaken when you answer that question. Lord, bless this preaching of your word. Lord, I pray that you would just fill me with, Lord, your truth your spirit, your word. Lord, use my feeble attempts to preach a message, to speak words of truth, words of eternity into the hearts and lives of your people. Lord, we love you. We give this time over to you. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to find three perfect things in this description of of the new Jerusalem. The the, the first is is kind of um, implied that they're going to be there. Um, But it's a perfect people. A perfect people. Again, we're we're building off those faithful and true promises of last week. Remember, we we looked at that when when Jesus says in verse 5 there, right, for these words are faithful and true. And we, we talked about those faithful and true promises. Well, this builds off those faithful and true promises to the, the people that God is delivering them to. And what we find is that here they are a, a perfect people. We find the completion of God's promise of redemption. Look with me before we even jump into verse 9 here. Look with me first in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 10. First Peter chapter 5, verse 10. Holy Spirit through the Apostle Peter here is, is speaking um, eternal words into our, into our situation. And he's talking to, um, obviously, a, a group of believers that, that were, were suffering. Because much of what Peter talks about is, um, is, is the suffering that they are experiencing. And here in verse 10, he says, After... You suffer for a little while. He's talking about our experience in in this world, right? Um, Being a Christian doesn't mean being separated from suffering. Um, Being a Christian means that that God will be with you during suffering. That God will strengthen you through suffering. But ultimately, God will use suffering, again, 
for His glory. Remember, all for the glory of God. We have to remember that. That's not just a, a mantra or something we hang on the fridge and look at and be like, oh yeah, all for the glory of God. When God says it, He absolutely means it. So even suffering is all for the glory of God. Here, Peter is reminding the church that is not the first time he's reminded them that is several times and I, I think we need to re, be reminded that over and over again as we walk through this life what we find is suffering we find various trials we, we find all these things but we're constantly reminded that hey God is producing something in us and through us that, that cannot be produced any other way Again, we're, we're going to look at you know, all the, the precious stones that, that create the, uh, the foundation walls of the New Jerusalem. And precious stones are created under pressure. Perfect people are created under the various pressures of trials and suffering of this life. So Peter reminds him, he says, after you have suffered for a little while. Why does he say a little while? Is that a promise that no matter what you're going through, it's only going to last a little while? No. He's looking at life as compared to eternity. Right? He says, you know what? This is momentary light affliction. The Apostle Paul calls it in 2 Corinthians. And in and, and Romans, he says, I, I, don't, I don't think that this present suffering is, can even be compared to, to the glory that is going to be revealed to us. So he says, in light of eternity, what we're suffering here is a little while. And I think sometimes we make such a big deal about it because it's all that we know because we don't have the right perspective. But he says, after you've suffered for a little while, the God of all grace. I, I, that is so important. That's such a foundational truth there. Just because you're suffering for a little while doesn't mean that God is not still gracious. I think sometimes we think God is only gracious to us when we're not suffering. But yet we find the grace of God to be even a more real, more powerful thing in our lives when we are suffering. He says, knowing, he says, the grace of, or the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself perfect, confirm, strengthen, and establish you to perfect us. That is this, this faithful and true promise of God that in that day when when we see Jesus face to face John says we will we will see him for who he is because we will be we will be like him um, that the righteousness of Christ that is now imputed in that day will be perfected we, we will we will be what God from from creation intended us to be and we will have that that fellowship with him but verse 9 it says then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues came and spoke with me saying come here and I will show you the bride the wife of of the Lamb. It's interesting because we're, we're, we're doing a transition here of the subject of, of what the angel is talking about. Because first he, talk, he starts talking about the bride. Well, what is the bride? The bride is the church, right? The, the, the bride of Christ. But then he transitions. He says, the wife of the Lamb. Why has it gone from a bride to a wife? Why? Because the marriage supper of the Lamb has already taken place. Look back in Revelation 19, verses 7 and 8. It says, let us rejoice and be glad and give the glory to Him. There it is again. Why are these things happening? Why is God perfecting His people? Why is, is the bride coming to this time of fulfillment for the glory of Him? Let us come and rejoice and be glad and give glory to Him. For the marriage of the Lamb has come and His bride has made herself ready. It was given to her to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean. For the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. The marriage supper of the Lamb has, has taken place. The, the bride of Christ has been perfected. And now they're spoken of here as, as the wife of the Lamb. So now John sees not just the church. But he sees all the saints from all the ages and the place that God has prepared for them, the new Jerusalem. So here the wife of the Lamb is not just the people, 
but it's also the place. Um, and that becomes our transition from, from a perfect people to a perfect place. But, um, but again, one doesn't exist without the other. Um, they both find themselves coming together in this one place, and both are, 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 are perfect. Verses 10 and 11. Gives says, And he carried me away in the Spirit to a great and high mountain. And he showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. Her brilliance was like a very costly stone, as a stone of crystal clear jasper. What John sees is, he sees... It's heaven coming down and being situated in the center of the new earth. And again, that, that, that term heaven is it's, it's a generic term that describes many places. Um, whether we're talking about paradise, whether we're talking about the, the bosom of Abraham, whether we're talking about the, the new heaven, the new earth, or whether we're talking about the new Jerusalem. Heaven is, is an all-exclusive. Basically, where the presence of God is, that is heaven. Um, but what we see here is, is heaven coming down and being situated in the center of the new earth. They're, they're no longer two separate entities, but they're, they're brought together in the center of that is the new Jerusalem. But what I found interesting, and, um, and my mind immediately went there when, when I read this description where um, John says, The angel carried me up on a great and high mountain, and he showed me the holy city, New Jerusalem. Um, what I noticed was the contrast between the holy city here that he is looking at and the worldly city that Jesus or that Satan offers to Jesus during his temptation. And you, you kind of get the sense that uh, as, as Satan is, you know, he, he takes Jesus up on the mountain and he shows him the, the cities of the world. And he says, the kingdoms of the world. We'll, we'll go there in a minute, Matthew 4. Um, and he says, you worship me and I'll give you all this. But Jesus had already been to this day, right? I mean, Jesus said, why, why am I going to settle for that when I, when I know that this already exists? Why, why would I settle for lesser things when I know that, that heavenly things have already been made? Look, look, look in Matthew chapter 4, verses 8 and 9. Matthew 4, verse 8 there. It says, Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, After these things I will give you, if you or all of these things I will give you if you fall down and worship me. He, he's showing him you know, the kingdoms of the world and all its glory. But Jesus understood the kingdom of God in all its glory. And the, the reason why I, I, I bring that up is because we, we need to follow the footsteps of, of Jesus here. Jesus didn't settle for the world in its glory because he knew the promise of God's city filled with God's glory. And, and that's the same thing that Satan does the same thing to us as well. He says, you know what? Hey, look at the, look at the things of the world here. Look at the things that I, I've laid out for you. Hey, no, don't, you, don't you want more of that? Don't, 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 don't you want to indulge in the glories of this world and in whatever those things are? And, and we have to, to be like Jesus and say, no. Why would I settle for a lesser glory when I've been saved for the greatest glory of all? I've been saved for the glory of God. Look in Colossians chapter 3. The Apostle Paul writes it this way, um, but the same exact truth in Colossians 3, verses 1 through 4. Therefore, if you've been raised up with Christ, um, raised to, to spiritual life, uh, been born again, 
you've been saved. Uh, you, we, again, Scripture uses a, a vast vocabulary of describing our salvation. Why? Because our salvation is so rich, so full. Um, he says, if you've been raised up with Christ... Keep seeking the things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above and not on the things that are on the earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ who is our life is revealed, then you also will be revealed with Him in Glory. Again, it's the, the glory of God. He says, keep your, your, your mind um, on things above. Why? Because that's where the glory of God is. That's where the glory of Christ is. That, that is where we will dwell and reign with Christ one day in glory. He says, don't get swept up in, in the glory of this world. Don't settle for counterfeit glory. But keep your mind, keep your focus. Keep your attention on the glory of God. We see that God creates for Himself a perfect people. Again, that's all for His glory. Secondly, this morning we see God, He also creates a perfect place. A perfect place. Pick it up there, verse 12. So isn't it had a great and high wall with twelve gates, and at the gates twelve angels, and the names were written on them, which are the names of the twelve tribes of the sons of Israel. And there were three gates on the east, and three gates on the north, and three gates on the south, and three gates on the west. It was this is very um, similar to um, we look at as the uh, children of Israel were wandering through the wilderness. Um, the tabernacle would be in the middle. And they were arraigned with three tribes on the east, three tribes on the north, three tribes on the south, three tribes on, on the west. Um, the city is now laid out like that. Verse 14, And the wall of the city had twelve foundation stones, and on them were the twelve names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. So the city has twelve gates, founded upon twelve stones, with Jesus being the chief cornerstone. We have to always remember that. Jesus is that chief cornerstone. He, he's what determines what is square, right? He determines you know, what, where one wall goes off in the direction so you know that it'll come back and it'll exactly meet at that point because it is all founded on that stone that does not move. That, that stone that defines all the other things is the Lord Jesus Christ. So the foundation of this very city ultimately is Jesus, but Jesus working through these, you know, whether it's the 12 tribes of Israel, the 12 apostles, Old Testament saints, New Testament saints, you're only coming into the city through the Lord Jesus Christ. Look in uh, 1 Corinthians Chapter 3, verse 11. It says, For no man can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Ephesians chapter 2. Verses 19 and 20. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus Himself being the cornerstone. So, what is being built here, whether it's, it's described as a house, whether it's described as a city, um, is all built upon the foundation of the Lord Jesus Christ and upon the foundation of, of the Old Testament saints, upon, upon the foundation of the New Testament apostles. That, that is what he sees defining these, these walls in, in the city of, of New Jerusalem. But he continues... Verse 15, he says, And the one who spoke with me had a gold measuring rod to measure the city 
and its gates and its walls. And the city is laid out as a square with its length is as great as its width. And he measured the city with a rod 1,500 miles. Its length and its width and its height are equal. And he measured its wall 72 yards according to the human measurements, which is also angelic measurements. And the material of the wall was jasper, and the city was pure gold like clear glass. The city was, was laid out like, uh, he says, the footprint of the city was a square, but when you throw in the dimension of the walls of the city, it was like a cube. Um, there, there's another um, structure in the Old Testament that was laid out like a cube. It was the Holy of Holies, um, where the, the presence of God dwelt in the midst of the tabernacle, in the midst of the children of Israel. Again, remember, keep in mind, everything in the Old Testament was just foreshadowing of, of what was to come. So think about this, as the children of Israel, as they marched through the wilderness, every time they set camp, they were foreshadowing this. You, you had in the center was the tabernacle. And in the center of the tabernacle was the Holy of Holies. And then you had the 12 tribes, three on each direction. They're all surrounding what well, was ultimately the presence of God in the center. Well, now the presence of God is, is represented in the, the entire city now is the Holy of Holies, if you will. But look with me in 1 Kings chapter 6. First Kings chapter six and verse twenty. The inner sanctuary or the also referred to as the, the Holy of Holies was 20 cubits in length, 20 cubits in width, and 20 cubits in height. And it was overlaid with pure gold. He also overlaid the altar with cedar. So here you have this, this cube structure. And the entire thing is overlaid with gold. Well, here you have the, the layout of the city is also a cube. And what, what, does, uh, what does John see that it is, it is made of? So the city was pure gold, like clear glass. See, the, the representation was just overlaid with gold. But now, the realization, it is, it is made of pure gold. Look in uh, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 24. In Hebrews laid out comparing the, the, the new covenant in Christ with, with the old covenant that, that um, God had made with Israel. And again, the, the, the thesis of Hebrews would be Jesus is better. Um, Jesus is the fulfillment of all these things. And he's talking about the sacrifice here. And, um, he says, For Christ did not enter a holy place made with hands. Remember that on the Day of Atonement, the priest would, would go into the, the Holy of Holies, right? That inner sanctuary, and he will offer up a sacrifice. But that sacrifice had to be offered year after year after year. Why? Because it was only a foreshadowing of, of the Lord Jesus Christ, right? It never intended to bring about perpetual or eternal redemption. But Jesus did. He says, well, when Jesus offered his sacrifice... He, he didn't enter into the, the holy place made with hands. In other words, he didn't enter into the, the earthly tabernacle, he says, which is a mere copy of the true one, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. He entered into the heavenly holy of holies that is now coming down from heaven and it is occupying his place in, in the center of, of God's new creation. We continue. Verse 19, he says, And the foundation stones of the city wall were adorned with every kind of, of precious stone. Um, again, I'm not going to read those, those lists of stones, but you just kind of get the idea. It's kinda, you're kind of overwhelmed by precious stones at this moment. Verse 21, 
He says, And the twelve gates were twelve pearls. Each one of the gates was a single pearl. And the street of the city was pure gold, like transparent glass. Everything, everything in this perfect place is designed to reflect one thing, the glory of God. I mean, think about all, you know, the walls are adorned with all, made, made out of stone. He says, you know what, the city itself is pure gold. The streets, um, which, you know, the, the, the street would have ultimately, it leads to the throne of God, right? And to the throne of God and the, uh, you know, the, the, the floor that led into the, uh, into the Ark of the Covenant and the Holy Holies was gold. Um, but all these things, they have one single purpose, to reflect the glory of God. It's like you couldn't go, you couldn't look a direction without some facet of some stone that is just reflecting back the glory of God. This place exists for the glory of God and we are just allowed to be there. So we, we, we need to stop with um, speculation. I people Were well, the streets really made of gold? Well, yeah, um, but not that we are going to care um, because it all exists to reflect the, the glory of God. So not only do we see a, a perfect people in a perfect place, but thirdly and, and most importantly, because none of the first two happen without this third one, we see a perfect presence. Obviously that presence is, is the presence of, of the Lord Himself. Verses 22 and 23 he says, And I saw no temple in it. For the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb are its temple. And the city has no need of the sun or of the moon to shine on it. For the glory of God has illuminated it. And its lamp is the Lamb. So what we find in the city, and um, again, John's understanding of, you know, he, he lived during the, the, the time of, of the earthly Jerusalem. And what was dominated in Jerusalem was the temple. And now he sees the, the heavenly Jerusalem coming down. And immediately he noticed, okay, there's something missing here. There's no temple. He says, well, there's a good reason for that. There's no need for a temple. Um, because the presence of the Lord and the presence of, of Christ, they, they are there, but there'll be no temple. That means there's no cathedrals, no churches, no chapels, no houses of worship. We will be true worshipers, worshiping in the very presence of God. Think about that for a moment. There's no more symbolism. There's no more hindrance. There's no more settling for the copies of things. You know, sometimes we refer to churches as the house of God. Um, this is the house of God. There's no more copies of those things. And we, we will be true worshipers. And you know what? We will see what Moses was unable to see. And what God's people have longed to see. We'll see the face of God. Look in, uh, in, in Exodus 33. Again, we have that reminder where... Um, Moses had, had asked that question. Uh, he, he wanted to see the, the glory of God. And um, we, we see where God answers him in, in Exodus 33, verses 18 through 20. Then Moses said, I pray you, show me your glory. And he said, I myself will make all my goodness pass before you and will proclaim the name of the Lord before you. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and will show compassion on whom I will show compassion. But he said, you cannot see my face, for no man can see me and live. And then in Numbers chapter 6, um, which was often referred to as the, 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 the priestly blessing on, on the children of Israel. And, and part of that blessing was r really a, a request of, of this day. In Numbers chapter 6, verses 25 and 26. It 
Actually, go back to verse 22. We'll read the whole benediction here. The, the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to Aaron and to his sons, saying, Thus you shall bless the sons of Israel, and you shall say to them, The Lord bless you and keep you, and the Lord make His face shine on you and be gracious to you, and the Lord lift up His countenance on you and give you peace. Here, this benediction that God instructs Moses to tell Aaron. He says, you know what, say this to the people. It's a promise of, of this day, what they only got a, a, a glimpse of. We will see the fullness of. And here, Revelation tells us that because of that, there's, there's no more sun, there's no more moon. Why? Because the glory of, the, of God has illuminated it. And just think of you know, the glory of, of God in, in the center of this and in everything just reflecting His glory and His presence over all of this, this new creation. It is all, it is just consumed by the glory of Almighty God. And in verse 24, he says, And the nations will walk by its light, um, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. In the daytime, for there will um, be no night there. Its gates will never be closed. And they will bring the glory and honor of the nations into it. And nothing unclean and no one who practices um, abomination and lying shall ever come into it. But only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. See, in, in God's perfect presence, we have light. We have access, and we have perfect holiness. He says there's no, there's no sun, there's no moon. Why? Because we have God's perfect light. A fulfillment of, of Jesus' promise in John chapter 8 and verse 12. Then Jesus again spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. I mean, that's, we, we experience that in part now, but in this day we, we will experience that in full and in whole. We have light. We have access. This is the gates of the city are, are never closed. We have free access in and out into the, into the very presence of God. Look in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 18. For through Him, talking about through Jesus, through that relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, we have both our access in one Spirit to the Father. We have light. We have access. And we have perfect holiness. Because he says nothing unclean can come into the presence. No one who practices abomination. There's no lying. There, there's nothing sinful can ever come into it. But only those whose names have been written in the Lamb's book of life. Close with Jude 24 and 25. We see a, a, a promise of... Um, this doxology at the end of the short epistle of, of Jude. But again, it is, it is looking forward to this day. Now to Him, talking about Christ, who is able to keep you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of His glory, blameless with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, now and forever. Amen. We give all praise, all glory, all honor to the Lamb who is able to make us stand in the presence of Almighty God. Holy and blameless. Because of the power of His sacrifice on the cross. See, this is what God is accomplishing 
in our lives. And I, and I think we, we, we need to pause and we need to kind of reflect and, and, and ask ourselves. I mean, the first question is, do I own these promises? Meaning, are, are, are they mine? And not because I've earned them. Because Jesus has given them to me. These are promises that God makes, but these aren't promises to everyone. You notice in several of those passages of Scripture, these promises are to a distinct people. They are to God's people. They are to God's redeemed. They are to God's children. They are to the ones that God is saving. Do you know this morning that you can walk into the very holy presence of God because you've put on Christ. Because you've you've been spiritually made alive. Because you are going to be conformed into the image and likeness of our Lord and Savior. See, it's not just about a place marker and a destination. I think a lot of people want to believe in Jesus because they want to have a place marker and a place called heaven. It's believing all the promises that come along with that. It's trusting in every single one of those things, no matter what we're going through. Not just trusting in in the good times, but trusting it in in the dark times, in in the hard times. It's having that faith that is unwavering, that, 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 that faith that just really can't be, you just can't explain it. Do you have that in the Lord Jesus Christ? Again, as we do, we... We come face to face with the gospel. It's always an opportunity to repent. To turn from going your own way and turn and run towards God. And I I love that that parable of... It's often called the prodigal son. I think it's more the parable of the faithful father. When the son set his face towards home... What's the father do? The father runs to meet him. Once, once we determine our heart to repent, God doesn't say, I'll meet you halfway. God doesn't even say, I'll meet you most of the way. Once we determine in our heart to repent, God is right there. Maybe this morning you need to turn and trust God. For those of us who have our need for repentance doesn't doesn't cease the day of our salvation. Um, we, we still we, we still need to repent, but it's it's a different repentance. It's not the repentance of salvation. It's the it's the repentance of sanctification. The, the repentance of just being being cleansed, being washed. Because sometimes we, we get off, we, we, we go astray, we need to get re-centered. And maybe for us this morning, our, our mind has become more set on the glory of this world than on the glory that God has set before us. Maybe this morning we, we, we just needed that reminder. Why do we keep settling for counterfeit glory? God has promised us the real thing. And maybe this morning we need to turn to the real thing. Those faithful and true promises of God. Again, as we always do, we'll have... Our time of invitation. You know.
know, sometimes we have intentions to repent. We have a desire to repent, but maybe it seems week after week there's just a disconnect between what happens Sunday morning during church and then what happens when I walk out and get right back into the world. Maybe this morning we just want it to be a little different. Maybe week after week you've just sat in your pew like, yeah, I know that's me. I, I know I need to do this. I need to change that. I, I, I need to seek after this. I, I know I need to do that. And yet it seems like week after week you just stumble and you stumble and you stumble. Maybe this week you need to change things up a bit. Maybe you need to respond to an altar call and just come up here and just pray. Say, Lord, I, I'm serious this time. I'm done playing games. I'm done settling. I only want you and your glory. And maybe for the glory of God, we need to just come. Surrender to Him for salvation, for continued uh, uh, obedience to Him, that we would walk in sanctification, that we would live according to the name by which we call ourselves Christians. We live for Christ. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I... Lord, I pray this morning recognizing that Lord, the, the new Jerusalem doesn't just exist for your glory, but Lord, your word tells us that we exist for your glory. And Lord, I, I pray what the uh, Scripture says in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31. It says, For whether you eat or drink, All that you do, do unto the glory of God. Every earthly activity, no matter how mundane or how ordinary, should be done with a very real intention of glorifying our Lord and Savior. Lord, I, I pray that Lord, we, we can really truly grasp that. Because when we get a sense of that, Lord, everything changes. Lord, I, I pray that, Lord, as we step into this morning and, uh, Lord, step into a new year when people are, are thinking about change and, and doing things differently, Lord, I pray that we would turn to the only source that, that is able to give us the strength and power to do that. That we would turn and run to you. Lord, I, I pray over this invitation. I pray that your will be done. I pray that your name would be lifted up. Lord, I pray that you would do all things for your glory this morning. Lord, we love you. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.